Hey, welcome everyone and uh, praise the Lord. Welcome to the class on Romans. Um, I was just telling the previous class I was teaching the, the second years is telling them, okay, it's time to go to Rome. I have to <laughs> teach them about the Romans. Okay, teach the Romans theological truth. So it's time to go to Rome. So here we are in Rome. Okay, to learn all the important um, doctrines and teachings that um, Paul has so beautifully uh, written uh, through the empowering and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we'll um, we'll begin. We'll just look at a uh, quick recap of um, what we uh, learned yesterday from chapter three, and then today we are just going to move on to chapter four. Okay, so uh, let's begin. Um, can one of you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Where's the mic? Yeah. Okay. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful morning, my Father God, as we come here to learn from your word, my Father. Help us to learn and thank you from the word, my Father God. And I thank you, my Father God, for your grace and favor. Thank you for selling my my Father. Thank you for everything. We give you glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So just as a quick uh, recap, in chapter 1, uh, you know, um, after his salutation and expressing his desire to go to Rome, Paul, uh, you know, starts by saying that we have all sinned against God. Okay, and in the midst of this, he's establishing the existence of God and he's talking about the invisible attributes of God that is revealed in creation. It says the invisible attributes of God, the, the power of the Godhead is revealed to us in creation. So Paul is saying that none of us have any excuse. None of us, whether they are Jews or Gentiles, cannot say that, hey, we don't know that there is a God, because when we look at creation, creation reveals to us the invisible attributes of God. It reveals to us the Godhead. And um, he says, in spite of us knowing the truth, in spite of us seeing the glory of God, but we have rejected the truth, we have rejected the glory of God, and hence we have given ourselves to idolatry, our, uh, to a depraved mind, where you know we have gone in the wrong ways, we have done things that have displeased God into immoral lifestyle, and you know, God let's just lets us go. He does not stop us. Okay, so that is chapter one and chapter two. Paul is, uh, we know, is specifically writing to the Jewish people, and he says, you know, you Jews, uh, God has given you the law, the circumcision, and both of these things are wonderful things. But don't think because you have both the law and circumcision, which is a sign of the covenant, you can judge others and you can also escape the judgment of god okay so though you have the law and you have the covenant of circumcision you also stand before god condemned okay and he says the gentiles you don't have the law you don't have the covenant but god has put in you a written law which is your conscience and the conscience that is in you tells you what is right and wrong okay so when we put chapter one and chapter two together we see that every person has two witnesses from god one is reason where we can observe creation and we can say there is a god and we have second our conscience our conscience tells us what is right and what is wrong which means that we have a sense of morality so yes, he says, we're all guilty before God, but God has provided us a solution. So he comes to chapter 3, um, where he's talking about this, and he's saying that in, uh, in chapter 3, he says, you know, um, he's asking a few rhetorical questions there, and, uh, you know, which he knows will rise up in the minds of the uh, Jewish readers, and he's answering it. Uh, himself and he's saying that you know he's establishing the fact that all of us have all of us have sinned that is what he's bringing up all of these questions to you know he's saying that 
uh, Jews, whether you have the law, you have the covenants, the Gentiles, whether you have the inbuilt law, the reason, the conscience, you know, but all of us are guilty before God and we have all sinned. None of us are righteous and we have lost the glory of God. And then he's providing us a solution. Okay. And he says that, you know, what is a solution? Yes, it is. It is the cross of Jesus Christ, what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So when you believe what Jesus has done on the cross and that which is given to you by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, then you, you know, are made righteous before God. So righteousness is not by keeping the law. Righteousness is not, is not by keeping some specific rituals or observances. Righteousness is not by even doing uh, the circumcision, which is a sign of the covenant, but you become righteous by grace through faith. Okay. And um, he talks about that very beautifully in, um, in, in chapter three. And then he talks about uh, the law. Okay and faith and he says uh, the law was given to people why was the law given to people to show us what is right and wrong okay however no one is perfect and no one is able to keep the law and because none of us are able to keep the law we keep breaking the law which means all of us are guilty before God because we sin. Okay. And so what does the law do? The law exposes that we are sinners. The law shows that we have fallen short of God's standards. Okay. So he says that is the purpose of the law. So what is the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to show us that what we, that we have broken the law. We can't keep the law that we are guilty of sinning. And you know, the law exposes that we are sinners and that we fall short of God's standards. Okay. Now, he comes to the end and he says, you know, now faith establishes the law. So Paul says, faith establishes the law, which means he says that faith doesn't get rid of the law. Faith does not nullify the law, but actually faith, what does it do? It fulfills the purpose of the law. Okay. Now the law shows us that we cannot be righteous in, in our own strength. So we need Help, yes or no? The law is saying, hey, you can't keep any of these laws. You're breaking everything. You can't keep the laws. So you need help. So it's the law is basically pointing. What is the purpose of the law? To show us what is right and wrong. To show us that we have sinned, that we have gone away from God. The, the purpose of the law is also, it was pointing out to the Messiah. Okay, so that is very beautiful. Everything in the Old Testament, whether it's the law, whether it's the covenants, whether it's the uh, rituals, whether it's the sacrifices, everything that was done was all pointing to the Messiah. Everything was fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? So here he's saying that, you know, he's saying that faith establishes the law. What he's meaning is that faith doesn't get rid of the law, but actually faith is fulfilling the purpose of the law. The law shows us that none of us are righteous on our own, and hence, and we cannot keep the law on our own, so we need a Savior, and we need Jesus Christ. And that is why God also knew that we cannot keep the law. That's why he says, I will write your law, the laws upon your heart and your mind, Ezekiel chapter 36, I think, and he says, or 26, and he says, I'll write your laws upon your heart and mind, and I will put my spirit in you, and my spirit will cause you to obey all of the laws and the uh, commandments, okay? So, Paul says that Jesus took upon himself the punishment for our sins, and when he took the punishment for our sins, you know, uh, which the law condemned, the law condemned what? What did the law condemn? Sin. The law condemned sin. And when Jesus took the punishment of our sin, God judged sin in the person of Jesus Christ. So through faith in Jesus, you know, people can be 
justified. People can be made right with God. That's why Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Why does he say that? Because the Jews were feeling very condemned that they could not keep the law but jesus took upon himself the punishment for our law the which the law condemned jesus took upon himself he became a condemnation for us so we are no longer condemned so the god the father judged sin that was condemned in the person of jesus christ so through faith in jesus we people can also be justified. We also can be made right with God. Now, all of this is not in your notes. So if you want to make notes, you can make, okay? Now, um, then he talks about, after talking about Christ's role, he talks about faith and law. He says, hey, faith does not mean that the law is unnecessary, okay? Now, he says, you're being made righteous, how? By putting faith in Jesus Christ. So that does not mean that the law is not necessary, that the law is void. It's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's done away with. No, he says, instead, faith acknowledges that we can't keep the law by our own efforts. Okay. And faith confirms what the law has been telling us all along. What is the law telling us all along? That we have fallen short of keeping the law and that we need salvation, which means we need somebody to save us from our sins and help us to keep the law. So in coming to Jesus through faith, we are affirming the law's truth and purpose. Okay, so that is what he is saying when he's talking about the faith and the law. Okay, so in conclusion, he's saying that the law shows us that we are not good, good enough on our own and faith in Jesus is the only way we can become righteous. So believe in, when we believe in Christ Jesus, we fulfill what the law has been trying to tell us that we need God to save us. Okay, so I'm just repeating this because I know for some of you it might be a big puzzle yesterday. What is this law, faith, Jesus, propitiation? How is the faith uh, fulfilling the law? How is uh, uh, grace fulfilling the law? How is the, you know, Jesus, how Jesus dying on the cross, how is it fulfilling the law and all of those things? So I thought I'll just give you a brief summary and I hope it helped now. Okay, any questions anyone has? Regarding this, chapter 3, before we move on to chapter 4, or is still a puzzle, which is puzzling all of you, or you're able to understand? I think from the expressions on your face, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, you just have to understand that the law condemned sin, but when Jesus died, sin was condemned, okay, on the cross. And that is why we are no longer under any condemnation. And how does faith fulfill the law? Faith, uh, the law says that we cannot keep the law, so we need a savior. And so who is our savior? Jesus, because the, it is, the sin is condemned in him. God has judged sin in the person of Jesus Christ. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are able to be made righteous, we are able to keep the law, and that is how the purpose of the law is being, or the truth of why the law is given, is being fulfilled. Okay, so that is just a brief summary. Okay, we'll move on to chapter 4. Anyone has any questions so far? Okay. In chapter 4, uh, you know, uh, when, when we look at chapter 4, it can be divided into two main sections. One where uh, Apostle Paul is establishing that this faith came before the law and the covenants. Okay, so the faith that he's basically talking about faith, which is continuing from where he left off in chapter 3. We need to know that, you know, this is a letter, so there is a continuation, okay? So he's talked about faith, and before that he's talked about the law. So here now he's continuing to talk about faith in chapter 4, where he's talking about righteousness by faith, how we can be made righteous by faith. And so he here is establishing that this faith came before the law and the covenants. It's not something new that happened now. And then he mentions Abraham. 
Why does he mention Abraham? Okay, it was before the covenants and the law was given, okay. But why is he mentioning that here? Okay, uh, he uh, Abraham's faith pleased God, okay. He was made righteous through his faith, okay, good. Why else? Who is Paul writing to? Jews. And so he knows that Abraham was their patriarch. Okay, he's a forerunner, he's a father. So he says, Hey, Abraham had faith, and how did he receive? And he received righteousness by faith. Okay, and this happened even before the law and the circumcision was given to people. Okay, circumcision was given after Abraham had faith. Yes or no? Yes, okay. God called him, he said, Go to the place I'm going to give you. Okay, and then, okay, he had faith and that was credited to him as righteousness. So both circumcision and the law came after faith. And so what Paul is saying here is that faith did not show up now after Jesus died on the cross. But faith, he's saying, was way back with Abraham. It was even before circumcision. It was even before the law. And now he is basically saying all this to get their attention of the Jews. I mean, it's, 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 it's so interesting the way Paul is, you know, uh, speaking such an intellectual way of putting things across, yet simple and so powerful. And look at the connecting, uh, the way he's connecting things. It's just so interesting. And uh, when we read this and when we listen to it, like, Oh my gosh, I never thought of this, you know. But look at how the Holy Spirit has inspired him, how he thinks, how he's writing, okay. So that is first part of chapter 4. I said the chapter 4 is divided into two main sections. So that is first part. And the second part of chapter 4, he's giving us insights into Abraham's faith. What he's saying is that faith is what both Jews and Gentiles are going to walk in. Jews and Gentiles are not going to walk by law, rituals, system, circumcision, covenant, and all of that. Both Jews and Gentiles are going to walk in faith. Okay, so whether you are a Jew or you are Gentile, you're going to walk in the faith of Abraham. And he talks about Abraham's faith in God. And he says how, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, we must have faith in God. Okay, so from faith... Then he transitions next into grace, which is he's slowly building up on that, which he's going to talk in chapter 5. So slowly he's taking us through the important aspects of the Christian faith here in chapter 4. Okay, So just amazing how Paul is exp expressing the mind of God in helping these people to see that faith is both for the Jews and for the Gentiles. Okay, so with that, we will just read uh, chapter 4. How many verses are there in chapter 4? Uh, um, 25. Okay, so I think five of you can read uh, five verses each. And I think online students, uh, one or two of you can also read as well. So can we begin uh, reading chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Each of you can read five verses and then we'll continue. Anyone from our online students would like to start? Verses 1 to 5 of chapter 4. Okay, you can continue. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Nina. Uh, you're able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. What shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, 
but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, ungodly. his faith is accounted for righteousness. Amen. Thank you. So can someone continue reading from verse 6 to verse 10, please? Yes, go ahead. Just as David also described the bless, bless endless, blessedness of the men to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those who lawless deeds are forgiven and who, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord said not impute sins. Does this blessed, blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Amen. Thank you. So I can continue reading from 11 to 15. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision, to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still circumcised. For the promise that he would be the their uh, heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteous righteousness of faith. For if possible, if those who are of the law are his faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no trans transgression. Thank you. Amen. Uh, can somebody else continue reading? <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Yes, Chaya, you can continue reading from 21 till 25, till the end of the chapter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for all who believe in him who raised jesus our lord from the dead he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification amen amen thank you so uh verses um uh, chapter four you know even as we read through it anything that really struck you if you were following Anything that really spoke to you, anything that really ministered to you, some words that came alive, something that God spoke to you in the past, or you heard something you want to share from chapter 4, anyone? Or uh, none of us read Romans because it's a difficult book to understand. <laughs> 
Anything that struck you, that God spoke to you, anything that you were reminded? Online students, and anyone like to share? Can you please take the mic? Hmm. Uh, verse 20 and 21, it's telling that God is a promise keeper. Like whatever he will, uh, he promised us. If some th sometime we feel like, um, like time is going on, like God, when God will do it. But um, like God's time is always perfect. He does everything in his right time. Okay, thank you. Verse 20 and 21, Chaya Paul says God's promise for each one of us and whoever believes in him. Okay, yes. Okay, yeah, can you just take the mic and read it? Yes. Verse 17. Can you read that? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, in the later part, God who gave life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as they did. So, so many times this happened in, in my brother's life also. We prayed together and he got a really a great miracle. Okay. And in my life also, actually. Okay, so speak into things that are dead, and God calls things that are uh, dead as though they are. Okay, yes. Okay, anything else? Anything else? Anyone wants to share? No? Online students, anyone? Okay, there's nothing, then we'll move on. We'll study chapter 4. Uh, we'll begin by looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. So verse 1 says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? Okay, so he starts off by asking a question in verse 1. Because he says, you know, he knows that the Jews took pride in Abraham and David. Okay, they, these were the two great patriarchs. The, uh, Abraham was their father, the father of the entire Jewish race, and David, their king, who would uh, establish them in the land, and God had appointed him, and God had promised that there would be a king forever on the throne in the line of David. Okay, so when Paul says Abraham, they understood him as their forefather and as their forerunner. Okay, so that is why he's using the example of Abraham here, because they understood him as their forerunner and as their forefather. So he asked this question, was Abraham justified by works? Okay, so he knew that the... Um, uh, you know, the Jews were so focused on just mere rituals, works, sacrifices, okay? And they thought that righteousness is by works, okay? So he asked the question, was Abraham justified by works? And then uh, he quotes this verse from the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Can quickly somebody turn to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and read what it says, please? Genesis 15, 6. Uh, Genesis 15, 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So it's amen. So he's saying, Abraham believed whom? God. And, or he had faith in God, and it was count, counted to him as righteousness. So it was credited to him as righteousness. That means when he believed God, whose righteousness came on Abraham? God's righteousness. It was like God's righteousness was put into Abraham's account. Okay. So Abraham received righteousness based on one thing. And what was that thing? That he believed in God. Okay. So no one can argue what Paul is saying because he's basing what he's saying from scripture. Okay, so he's saying, hey, look at Abraham. What does the scripture say about him? It says he believed God and God granted it to him as righteousness. Okay, now the Greek word accounted, 
that Paul is using here in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, is an, a very important word that we must consider. And Paul uses this word almost 11 times in this chapter. Okay. Now, in the NKJV, it's translated as accounted, and it's mentioned in verses 3, verse 5, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 22. Okay. And also the word counted is mentioned in verse 4. And the words imputes, impute, and imputed is also mentioned in verses 6, 8, 11, 23, and 24. Okay, so all these words is meaning the same thing, accounted. Okay, now in the KJV, this is translated as counted or reckoned or imputed. Okay, now this word basically has to do with financial accounting okay, or calculation, okay, so it's a word that's used in finance and accounting and calculation, and it simply means to put down into one's account, so you're putting something into somebody's account, so when you're talking about, you know, accounted, imputed, imputes, counted, you know, reckoned, whatever, it's all meaning that you're putting into somebody's account, okay, so Abraham believed God, and God deposited into his account. What did God deposit into his account? Righteousness. So it was God credited it, it to him, or God accounted it to him, or God put it into his account. And what did he put into his account or credited to him? It was righteousness. Okay. So Abraham received righteousness. How? By believing God. Okay. So that is what he mentions in verses 1, 2, and now we'll move on to verses 4 to 8. So can somebody read verses 4 to 8, please? Now, to him who works, he wa his wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as da David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to him, the Lord shall not impute sin. Amen. So he's saying here in verse 4, if a man works for something, then what he gets is not something by grace. He's paid what he is old okay now um, a system of works you know seeks to put god into debt okay now when we are he's why is he mentioning this is because the jews were looking at you know receiving righteousness by works so he's saying when we look at the system of works you know it seeks to put or when you're looking at receiving righteousness by works, it seems to put God in debt to us, or it makes God look like he owes us something, okay? And his favor is on us because of our good behavior, okay? So that is what we think, or that is what the Jews are thinking, okay? So this is what works in thinking, and we think that God owes us salvation because of our works, or our actions, or our good deeds, or the blessings that he's given us or giving us is because of our good works, okay? But if a man does not work, okay, he believes what he is receiving basically by grace, okay? It's by grace through faith, okay? So he's saying, hey, Abraham received righteousness. How did he receive righteousness? Purely by believing that it is by faith and not by works so that righteousness that god gave him is by grace okay so something that god gave to him okay and now he will explain this about grace later on in chapter 5 but he's saying that you know right abraham received it not because of his good works not because of something that he has done okay he received it purely by grace through faith 
Okay, so he put faith in God and he that his God's righteousness was put into his account. So he's saying that, hey, you Jews are thinking that, you know, by keeping this rituals, by making the sacrifices, by keeping this sign of the covenant, that because you're doing it, you are entitled. You're entitled to what? You're entitled to God's blessings. You're entitled to... Um, you know, his covenant blessings, You're, and God owes you something, and also God owes you salvation to save you. And that was the mindset that these Jews had. That is why when, you know, we read in the Old Testament, when the Jews were taken into captivity, they were telling God, God, why are you punishing us? You know, what did we not do? You know, why is this punishment you're giving to us? They thought, hey, we went and did those rituals. We went and made those sacrifices. We kept the feast. We kept the Passover. We made all those, you know, morning and evening sacrifices every day in the temple. What did we not do, God? Why are you punishing us? And so what they were doing, they were blaming God. And they felt they were entitled to God's blessing. They felt they were entitled to his uh, uh, you know, salvation. That means freedom. That is why they were looking for a Messiah. And they felt the Messiah has to come and deliver them from the Roman rule, okay? And they felt they were, what they were doing, there was it was not, uh, you know, was right. And God was, you know, there was nothing that God had to do to punish them. That's why, you know, the minor prophets like Malachi and Haggai and all of them who write and say, you know, God tells them, you know, look at the sacrifices that you are bringing. You know, and your worship in the temple, God tells, uh, I think it's Haggai, is the, the noise in the temple is, uh, your, your worship in the temple is like noise to my ears. And he says, shut the door of the temple. And he says, you're bringing these sacrifices to me. Take these sacrifices to your governor. You're bringing lame animals, sick animals. You take it to your governor. Will he accept it? You know, very forthrightly, God is telling through the prophet Haggai. So God is saying, hey, I have not punished you unnecessarily, not simply, because you have done what is wrong in my sight. Okay, But the people of the Jews, uh, the Israelites were feeling they were entitled to God's blessing. And so here Paul is telling us that, hey, when Abraham received righteousness from God, it was put into his account, it was done by the grace of God, because he had faith and it was not by his works. Okay. And so, you know, uh, we'll talk about grace in much detail in chapter five. But just to look at what grace is, the Greek word for grace is what? Anyone knows? Oxas glory. Grace. The Greek word is charis. Okay, and what is the meaning of we see the, the word grace means different things, three different things in the New Testament. Anyone knows? You studied in your first year, and I taught you in Minister's Foundation. What are uh, divine enablement? Okay, divine favor, yes. Divine empowerment, enablement, one is that, one is divine favor, and one more. It's a divine character, okay? So the New Testament, when we see grace, it is mentioned in these th three different contexts. It can mean one of these contexts in any of the given places. It can mean divine favor, divine character, divine enablement, or empowerment. So how is God, uh, the grace of God a divine um, a fa uh, uh, character of God. So look at what John chapter 1 verse 14 says. John chapter 1 verse 14. Can somebody read that? John 1 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. So what's the character of God? Grace and truth. Okay. Look at what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says. It says, for by the grace you have been saved through faith and not yourself. It is the gift of God. Okay. And look at what uh, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. Can somebody read that? 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. 
Second Peter 3.18. Eighteen, uh, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. So uh, Peter is encouraging us to grow in the grace. That means grow into being Christ-like in our character. Okay. So grace can mean divine character it can also mean divine en enablement or empowerment one example we see is uh, when paul you know uh, uh, has this thorn in his flesh which is repeated attacks from the enemy and he asks god to take it away and what does god say my grace is sufficient for you okay so that is divine enablement so paul god is telling paul paul you're going through this but i am going to empower you and enable you to go through all the suffering and difficulties whatever satan is putting as a hindrance so divine enablement is given to every believer okay so uh, the word charis or grace has to be uh, you know interpreted correctly in the context wherever we read in the new Testament. Now, in this context, in Romans chapter 4, it means divine favor. Okay. What is divine favor? What is favor? It's a generous deed. Okay. It is something that is done out of the heart of the bestower. Somebody is bestowing grace, favor, his goodness without expecting anything in return. You're doing something to somebody. Okay, that is favor. You're doing them a favor, but you're not expecting anything in return. Okay, and we often use this phrase uh, for grace, unmerited favor, right? So grace uh, in us is receiving what we do not deserve, what we cannot earn in our own strength, in our own ability, in our own works that we do. Okay, grace is God doing for us what he wants and he does it through us. So grace is basically God doing for us and through us what we could never do for ourselves. That is grace. I'll repeat that again. Grace is what God can is God is doing uh, in us and through us what we couldn't do for ourselves is what is the grace of God. Okay. So grace begins where our ability ends. Right? We can say that in another sense. We can say grace begins where our ability ends, where we're not able, and the grace of God just comes in and, uh, you know, uh, enables us to do what we cannot do. And so, uh, you know, grace is also often explained in this acronym, G-R-A-C-E. It's, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay, so the acronym G-R-A-C-E is God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay, so that is what is uh, grace. So he's saying here and telling the Jews, hey, you cannot receive this righteousness by any of the works that you do. Leave it because Abraham also received it only by grace and you too can receive only by grace through faith. Okay. So look at uh, the uh, verse uh, uh, 5. And in verse 5, look at the phrase, what he says, you know, but to him who does not work but believes on him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Okay. So here it says, him who justifies the ungodly. Okay. It's a very powerful a statement and it sounds very paradoxical that God is declaring the ungodly as righteous. How can you know an ungodly person be righteous? But God is saying yet he can do this because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What we studied yesterday or earlier in chapter 3. Because of the work that was done by Jesus Christ, the redemption, the price that was placed by Jesus Christ, you know, he can, Paul is saying that God can justify the ungodly, okay, because of what Jesus has done. And then he points out to David in verses uh, 6 to 8, and then he quotes from the 
Old Testament. <clears throat> Paul quotes two verses from Psalms 32. Um, and we look at another additional verse to understand the context. So can some one of you please read Psalm 32 verses 1 to 5, please? Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins, whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirits is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones were strayed away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hands was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgive the guilt of my sin. Amen. Thank you, Chaya. So Paul points out that even David received righteousness apart from the apart from works. And how did he receive righteousness here in these verses? How did he receive righteousness? Look at Psalm 32 verses 1 to 5. How did he receive righteousness? How did he receive that forgiveness? What did he do? He confessed his sin, okay? He confessed his sin and he received forgiveness, okay? So, <clears throat> by faith, David, when he confessed his sin, he received the blessedness of having his sins forgiven, okay? So, that was what he had received, okay? So, in verse 6, Paul is saying that just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Now consider this phrase, <coughs> Sorry. the blessedness. The blessedness of the man whom God declares righteous or the blessedness of the man who God credits with righteousness. Now being declared righteous you know, brings us into this place of blessedness, okay? It's a blessing that, that cannot be received by any other means or by any other place. So, Paul, uh, the uh, psalmist is saying, blessed is a man whose sins are forgiven. So, when David asks God for forgiveness of sins and he repents, he receives the blessedness of having his sins forgiven, okay? Are you all able to understand? Yes? Okay. Then we'll move on. Righteousness given by faith even before circumcision. Okay? Now, in verses 9 to 12, it's amazing how Paul is revealing the mind of God that faith is both for Jews and for Gentiles. Okay? Now, having established from the Old Testament examples of righteousness, uh, of Abraham and David that is based on faith or simply believing in God, Paul then addresses here questions of circumcision, okay? And he says, was this righteousness given because of circumcision? Now, Paul points back again to Abraham and who received righteousness by faith, uh, Genesis chapter 15 by and 6, before he even received the sign of circumcision, which is, we read in Genesis chapter 17, verse 10. So even before the sign of circumcision, the covenant of circumcision was given to Abraham, Abraham was made righteous. And how was he made righteous? He was made righteous by faith. Okay, so Abraham was blessed because of his faith in God, and he received his blessing. Now, how did he receive his blessing? We look at it in the next class. Okay, we'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll end class. Thank you all for joining class. I'll see you next week. Thank you.